Hey everybody, um, I'm back for our last short, short video on Operant Basics. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the final terms and concepts that we'll talk about with Operant Basics. So make sure you have your notes out. And if you want your textbook too, so you can follow along, uh, you should be able to describe the effects of shaping and you should be able to also describe the effects of biology on our ability to be operantly conditioned. So don't uh, hesitate to pause and rewind and check things out uh, and take notes, highlight, do all that good stuff. Okay, here we go. So some other concepts that we haven't talked about, and these are terms that we'll see in classical conditioning as well, they refer to some of the fundamental principles of conditioning. One of the first terms we look at is acquisition. Remember when you acquire something, um, you basically gain possession of it. So acquisition really refers to the acquiring of a conditioned voluntary behavior because that behavior is reinforced. So whenever a, a habit or a voluntary behavior is reinforced often enough or frequently enough, it may become habit. And that means that that behavior has been strengthened or acquired. A discriminative stimulus is a stimulus that occurs before our voluntary behavior that gives us an idea that if we were to exhibit that behavior, that we would get some kind of reinforcement or punishment. An example I like to use uh, is flirting behavior. Flirting is really a type of behavior in which we're kind of testing out to the other person to see if we ask them out on a date, or would they say yes? Um, or would they pay attention to us somehow? So we might look for smiles and laughs and uh, facial expressions or body language that would signal to us that if we pursued the relationship further, they might um, also be accepting of that pursuit. They might reciprocate that behavior. Also, if we're asking our parents for permission for something they don't normally give permission for, we might try to kind of feel our way through that situation and, and see if our parents are in a good mood or are they in a bad mood. Uh, which means they might not give us permission to do something else. So it's just uh, signals in the environment that let us know whether reinforcement or punishment is going to occur. Extinction, this is a really important term. This refers to the, the weakening, often gradual weakening of a behavior, just because it stops producing reinforcement. So if you really, really enjoy a video game when you're in sixth grade, and when you're in eighth grade, you play it, it doesn't really provide you that much fun anymore, well, then that behavior is likely to weaken. Uh, you're less likely to see that behavior occur. Eventually, you won't even play that game anymore. So the behavior has become extinguished. Um, they say extinction, but we'll find out in the classical conditioning part. It might not be extinct like the dinosaurs are extinct, it might just kind of be dormant in there, but anything that you do voluntarily is a behavior. If it doesn't bring about reinforcement, you're less likely to do it again. And you got to be aware of something called extinction burst. Now, I don't think this is in our textbook, but right before extinction happens or right before that behavior um, really starts to weaken, there might be this rapid increase in the behavior before extinction actually takes place. Now, my example is, you know, you press an elevator button and you know you're waiting for the elevator the the buttons lit up and nothing's happening so you go up and press it again you wait a few seconds and then you press it five or six times because you're annoyed and the elevator doesn't show up and then you go to a different elevator or you take the stairs so right before you gave up and your behavior decreased in frequency there was a sudden burst uh, of the behavior same with pushing a, a walk sign a walk button on a stoplight um, or a vending machine, you put in a couple bucks, you press your buttons, nothing comes out, you press all the buttons, and then you, you know, walk away in, in a fit of rage. Um, that's extinction burst. Now, in our Skinner box, um, the rat and lever pressing for food, Skinner, depending on the, the schedule of reinforcement, 
might watch an extinction burst of hundreds of bar presses before the rat just finally quit and, and stopped pushing that bar. Shaping is a, is a way we can use reinforcement um, to learn a very complex behavior, sometimes referred to as shaping by successive approximations. Um, so in order to do this, we have to identify a target behavior, what's our ultimate goal, and then we identify sub-steps or simpler steps that might get us to that target behavior. Because if we waited for, for example, a rat or a pigeon in a Skinner box to complete some complex behavior, we might never see him do it. So we establish a target behavior. This might be bar pressing for food, for example, for a rat. And what we do is we, we reinforce simple approximations of that behavior. Um, simpler, um, simpler examples of behaviors that might reach that target behavior. So at first we might, we might reinforce that rat anytime it's in the Skinner box and it just looks at the front wall. And once the, the rat makes the association between looking at the front wall and getting food, we withhold reinforcement until the rat moves towards the front of the room. Uh, front of the Skinner box towards that lever. Then we reinforce those behaviors until the rat makes the association and we see that acquisition has taken place. The rat spends all its time up by that, by that lever now, by the front wall. Then we, we stop reinforcing that behavior and only reinforce behavior when it rears up on its hind legs by the front wall or by the lever. And then when that behavior is acquired and the rat goes immediately goes to the front of that Skinner box by the lever and starts rearing up on its hind legs, we stop reinforcing that behavior until the rat actually presses the bar or touches the bar, and then the rat will eventually uh, bar press itself and make the association between bar pressing and food pellets. So the target behavior is acquired, and we reinforced and withheld these uh, simpler approximations. So we kind of build step by step. Um, from simple down here, very simple behaviors we reinforced until they're routine, and then we only reinforce that next step. And when that's routine or acquired, we only reinforce the next step. So we withhold down here and reinforce up here until they get to that target behavior. Now, we saw the squirrel obstacle in class the other day. Imagine how many steps it took for um, that squirrel to be shaped. Uh, until it exhibited that bizarre behavior. Although they probably use chaining in that case, which is uh, basically starting the animal it, that, at that target behavior in that feeding bin and then um, presenting an obstacle before that. And once the animal learns that, it gets reinforcement. And then we add a previous chain. And once it learns that, it can get to the last chain and get to the target behavior. But uh, that's a term we'll talk about later. Um, so we move from simple down here up to more complex behaviors until that target behavior is reached. Now, two more things here. We're almost done. Um, there's some limitations on what we can teach animals to do. Uh, and I, I just want you to remember that, that most reinforcement and punishment is, occurs naturally in, in the environment. It's not something we train animals to, to do with reinforcement and punishment. But um, in nature... An animal's biology can constrain or limit its ability to learn an operant behavior, to acquire a behavior, no matter how much reinforcement is done. An example in a study guide I've, I've used is, is it, can we use operant conditioning to train a pigeon to flap its wings in order to get food? Now, most people are saying, well, yeah, you can do that because a pigeon can already flap its wings, so you can train it to do more. But in reality, it's actually pretty hard to get pigeons to flap their wings to get food because biologically, pigeons flap their wings when they are frightened and they need to escape. They peck when they get food. It would also be difficult to, to teach a, a pigeon to peck in order to, to escape electric shock. So you might be able to do it, um, but it would be rather difficult. So we are limited by our biology, or at least uh, many animals are limited by their biology. Uh, another example of the limitations of operant conditioning for animal training would be instinctive drift. That animals, once they learn a difficult behavior because they were kind of constrained by their biology here, they might learn the behavior, but over time they might drift back to their instinctive behavior. So that pigeon who flaps its wings to, 
to get food might eventually start pecking again instead. Um, now, this instinctive drift, this can explain uh, as circus animals and trained animals going wild. So you can train a bear, a grizzly bear, or a brown bear in a circus to do these really weird tricks, but when that animal is surprised or frightened or something unexpected happens, it could drift back to its instinct behavior, which could be violent, actually. So if we remember a story several years ago about uh, the orcas at uh, Marine World in Florida, whatever they call Sea World, I think it is, and suddenly people were stunned when that uh, killer whale actually attacked uh, and killed its trainer of, of six or seven years, I think. And instinctive drift might, might explain that, that something in the animal is frightened or unexpected or maybe it was playing and got a little rough, drifted back to its instinctive behavior of being a killer whale. Okay, at least a big whale that's aggressive. So this happens to dogs and puppies when they nip back or bark or growl at their owners because they're frightened. Um, or maybe they bite a small child that gets in their face, even though they're docile most of the other times. So those are a couple examples of limitations of operant conditioning. Um, and we're going to stop there. So if you have questions, write them down in your notes, and we can ask in class. So great job, and uh, I'll talk to you later.